Dennis Prager here. Thanks for listening to the Daily Dennis Prager Podcast. To hear the entire three hours of my radio show, commercial-free, every single day, become a member of PragerTopia. You'll also get access to 15 years' worth of archives, as well as the daily show prep. Subscribe at PragerTopia.com. Well, good morning slash afternoon, wherever it is you might be. Welcome to the Dennis Prager Show. I'm Bob France sitting in for Dennis on this Friday, the ninth morning of the sixth month, otherwise known as the month of groom, as I like to call it, uh, in the year of our Lord, 2023. And what a day that we have in front of us. Holy goodness gracious. Uh, I'm live in the ReliefFactor.com studios of AM 1420, The Answer in Cleveland, Ohio, And it's a privilege to be with Dennis as he continues his listener tour in Europe. I literally just saw an update to the Trump story that we're going to be talking about for a good portion of the day 10 seconds ago. Uh, And it was posted 12 minutes ago. Former President Trump and two of his top attorneys representing him in special counsel Jack Smith's investigation have parted ways. Trump, the current front runner, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the lawyers representing him ahead of his indictment, Jim Trustee and John Rowley, resigned this morning. This morning, we tendered our resignations as counsel to President Trump, and we will no longer represent him on either the indicted case or the January 6th investigation, Trustee and Rowley said in a statement. It has been an honor to have spent the last year defending him, and we know he will be vindicated in his battle against the Biden administration's partisan weaponization of the American justice system. This is interesting. I just literally saw this before we started the broadcast, so I want want you to bear with me as we kind of discover this together, if you will, um, because that's interesting. It sounded, when I first saw that he was parting ways with two of his attorneys, that there may have been some trouble in the, you know, in the defense here, some disagreement or of some kind. But apparently that looks very supportive of President Trump. We are confident that he will be vindicated in his battle against the Biden administration's partisan weaponization of the American justice system. Uh, It goes on to say, now that the case has been filed in Miami, this is a logical moment for us to step aside and let others carry the cases through to completion. We have no plans to hold media appearances that address our withdrawals, which is unfortunate, for me anyway, or any other confidential communications we've had with the president or his legal team. End quote. How about that? Very interesting. So President Trump has taken to Truth Social in the wake of that announcement to state, for purposes of fighting the greatest witch hunt of all time, now moving to the Florida courts, I will be represented by Todd Blanche, Esquire, and a firm to be named later. I want to thank Jim Trustee and John Raleigh for their work, but they were up against a very dishonest, corrupt, evil, and sick group of people, the likes of which has not been seen before. He added, we will be announcing additional lawyers in the coming days. When will Joe Biden be indicted for his many crimes against our nation? MAGA. End quote. So there's just a little bit of breaking news as the program begins. And, uh, wow, um, obviously I want your reaction to that. Obviously we're going to be discussing and analyzing every element of this throughout the program today. We're going to do uh, as much free-for-all, open-line type uh, broadcasting as we can today. I do have a couple of other interviews that I have scheduled that I I want to carry through because what are we fighting for um, in this America First battle that we are in, in this uh, you know, battle against the weaponization, as one of the attorneys mentioned, of our justice system, weaponization of the uh, of the DOJ against the people, against Donald Trump, particularly. Obviously, there is a two-tiered system of justice that cannot be defended, should not be defended. It's not possible to. But what are we fighting for if we can't fight for all of our rights, you know, President Trump obviously is in the crosshairs for a number of reasons. And by the way, we have to consider all possibilities when it comes to what they are doing and why they are doing it. We'll get into that. I mean, I think the, the, the betting odds favor that the Biden administration, the DNC, the Department of Justice, 
the left-wing Marxists who pull Biden's puppet strings are all very, very intent on keeping him out of the presidential race. That's what the odds on, I think, betting, betting line would favor. But there is a question that many are asking that what if it's absolutely the reverse? Because what has happened in the last 12 hours since last night, 12, 15 hours, whatever it's been, since last night when we found out through President Trump himself that they were going to indict him on these seven federal charges related to the uh, classified documents found at Mar-a-Lago and not turned over, as the, as the charges say. What we have learned is that the entirety of American conservatism is rallying around Donald Trump, right? I mean, literally, thus far, the entirety of the American conservative establishment and, and movement is saying, oh my gosh, what has happened here? We just lost our republic. Josh Hawley, Senator Josh Hawley made it very, very clear. If Joe Biden is able to just jail his chief political opponent, well, then we don't have a republic anymore. Well, we might still have a republic, but it's not a constitutional republic. It's a banana republic. And he's right, of course. Left-wing attorney and former, uh, you know, or rather than former, we'll call him Harvard University uh, law professor emeritus, Alan Dershowitz, has said this indictment is unconscionable. The idea that we can indict the leader of the opposition party, unless you have literally a slam dunk, if you have something that is far more solid than what they used in Watergate, Something that would be so impossible to dispute so as to have a bipartisan effort to indict a president here. If the Republicans were like so aghast at what something Donald Trump had done that they joined the Democrats, because Alan Dershowitz pointed out, it wasn't Democrats who removed Nixon. It was Republicans. So unless it is even stronger than the case was against Nixon, that this indictment is unconscionable, unconstitutional even. You talk about protecting democracy, and the left screams about protecting democracy, right? This is what they talked over the whole January, so it was an attack on democracy. If you're talking about defending the democracy and protecting democracy, you don't jail your political opponent so that he can't become your political opponent. But my point to that is you have people, even on the left, certainly all of conservatism, but even constitutionally minded people on the left, like Alan Dershowitz and others saying, you can't do this. That this is almost a guarantee that Donald Trump is about to climb another 10, 15 points in the Republican polls. He is about to get the biggest boost that he has gotten since this whole thing began, since DeSantis entered the picture, since Haley and since Scott and since all the other names started coming in here. He's already been dominating the polls anyway. This is going to cement. I think Nancy Mace put it best. Representative Nancy Mace went on Fox last night and said, let me quote it here. Joe Biden just secured Donald Trump's nomination for Republicans in 2024. And so what we have to consider in being responsible people in analyzing this, we have to consider whether or not um, that's the intent. There are many on the left who believe Donald Trump can't beat Joe Biden in a rematch. That Donald Trump may have gotten his you know, most votes of any sitting president, 74 million, and he still lost by 7 million. Again, that's their count if you believe Joe Biden got 81 million votes. I do not. I do not. I believe, I believe election fraud is real, and I believe election theft happened in some very crucial battleground states, but I don't want to relitigate 2020 right now. My point is that they believe that Donald Trump is so unpopular with moderates, that Donald Trump is so unpopular with women, middle-class women, 
and that they can take advantage of the, the porn star hush money case. They can take advantage of so many of the salacious things that Donald Trump has been accused of that so many women and so many middle class moderates will not vote for Donald Trump, not in a million years. They feel like he is easier to beat. What if this indictment, which will, as Nancy May said, guarantee his nomination as we rally behind him and in support of him, is exactly what they want? That they're afraid of somebody who might actually appeal to moderates. I don't know what they're thinking is. I know that the, uh, the betting odds say that it's they're afraid to run against him. But there is the other side of that coin that says they want him to run, they want him to be the nominee, and the best way to do this is to continue the witch hunt, which will rally them behind him. So there's so many things to talk about today. Uh, we've got two interviews scheduled. I'll tell you more about those coming up. 8 Prager 776 is the number for you to dial. 8 Prager 776. I want to take as many phone calls as possible, get as many viewpoints as possible about the indictment of President Trump and the ignoring of the Biden family bribery scandal that came along with this. All of that is coming up. Stay here. I'm Bob France in for Dennis Breaker. Gold dealers are a dime a dozen. They're everywhere. What sets these companies apart and who can you really trust? This is Dennis Prager for AmFed Coin and Bullion, my choice for buying precious metals. When you buy precious metals, it's imperative that you buy from a trustworthy and transparent dealer who protects your best interests. So many companies use gimmicks to take advantage of inexperienced gold and silver buyers. Be cautious of brokers offering free gold and silver or brokers that want to sell you overpriced collectible coins, claiming they appreciate more than gold and silver. What about hidden commissions and huge markups? Nick Grovich and his team at AmFed always have my back. That's why I mention his name in each commercial message for him. Nick's been in this industry over 42 years, and he's established a reputation built on trust, transparency, and fair pricing. If you're interested in buying or selling, call Nick Grovich and his team at AmFed Coin and Bullion, 800-221-7694. AmericanFederal.com, AmericanFederal.com. 21 minutes past the hour. Bob France sitting in for Dennis Prager on this Friday, and what a unique Friday it is. I welcome you to the program, and I welcome your phone calls at 8 Prager 776. That's 8 Prager, or excuse me, 877 243 7776. And of course, I want your reactions to what just happened. Two questions. Number one Do you believe that? the indictment of Donald Trump announced last night was intended to bury the story of the oversight committee from earlier in the day in revelation of what we now know about the Joe Biden family bribery scheme. Because I don't think there's any possible way to dispute that. That the news cycle could not be focused for 24 or more hours, or maybe a whole weekend, going into the weekend. The news cycle could not be allowed to focus on the allegations and the revelations that in that form that was subpoenaed by the uh, the, uh, Oversight Committee from the Department of Justice, from the FBI, from Christopher Wray, the director of the FBI, that FD-1023 form. Um, That that form confirmed what had been reported. Now, remember, this was a non-classified document. So when it was subpoenaed by the Oversight Committee weeks ago, there should have been no hesitancy whatsoever in turning turning it over. But now we know why. Because it confirmed what multiple whistleblowers had said, that the Biden family was profiting to the tune of millions and millions of dollars from foreign adversaries, in many cases, Uh, in return return for and in exchange for access to the Obama White House when Joe Biden was vice president. Whistleblowers had brought this information forth. Tons of information from the Biden family laptop. Some people call it the Hunter Biden laptop. It's the Biden family laptop because it's filled with all of the Biden family secrets, verified now by the intelligence community. But all of those things had been reported in those spaces, and now we needed to see FD-1023 the form that literally confirms what was spoken, that $5 million went to Joe Biden, that another $5 million went to Hunter Biden, and that this money was moved through multiple shell corporations so that it could be hidden or washed before it got to the inevitable destinations, which are under the pockets of the Biden family members. 
Now, yesterday, Joe Biden, in in one of the most tone-deaf, flippant remarks that I can remember in recent presidential history, was asked about this and what the Oversight Committee found on that form and what the Oversight Committee found that corroborated the whistleblower statements and so forth. And his flippant respond, response was, where's the money? As if to say, prove it, find the money. He quickly then said, I'm only kidding, this is all a bunch of malarkey. But when he said, find the money, he basically is daring the conservatives, the Republicans in charge of the Oversight Committee, the Judiciary, and so on and so forth, daring them to catch him. It's unbelievable that he would even say such a thing. But he said, where's the money? As if money can't be hidden, as if money isn't being moved from account to account, which was already reported on by the whistleblowers uh, a couple of weeks back, and which now was confirmed by this, uh, this, this form that had been subpoenaed. Where's the money? So that story should be all we're talking about last night. It should be all we're talking about today. But instead of talking about those things, they went ahead and told Donald Trump, we're indicting you. So that the Trump indictment dominates the news cycle, dominates our conversation today. And, and suddenly the scrutiny of Joe Biden and the Biden family and what was on that forum and the work of the Oversight Committee, it just kind of, you know, fades into the wind. Now it's all about, ha-ha, we got Trump. We indicted Trump. His, his document scandal is going to cost him. So question one was, do you believe that this was the intent of the announcement to him and thus his revelation of it last night was intended to bury the revelation about Biden? That's number one. And number two, do you think that the intent of the Biden administration, the DNC, the political left that cannot stand Donald Trump, do you believe that they did this to rally support for him so that he becomes the clear-cut nominee And it's not even in question because they truly believe they'll beat him for reasons I said prior. Or do you believe it was just the opposite? And again, the money line says they're afraid of him. The money line says that Donald Trump's popularity, even after four years away from office, well, it's been two and a half, but by the time the election comes around, is still so high among the MAGA base that they're terrified that he could he could potentially win in a rematch with Donald Trump or with uh, Joe Biden. You know, they know full well Biden is very very vulnerable. What was the number? 73%. 73% including a majority of Democrats don't want Joe Biden to run again. He's 80 and his brain and his body are 95. I mean, really. 80 years old relatively speaking, even though we know that you know, average life life expectancy for a man is around, what, 74? And for women, that's like 77. So at 80, you could say he's really old. He's well past the actual expiration date. But 80 isn't that old depending on the shape you're in, depending on the cognitive ability you have, depending on a number of things. Now, we see a guy here who shuffles around like he's wearing the no-slip slip, uh, no slip socks that you wear in a, in a, in a nursing home. He shuffles the way he walks. He falls constantly, going upstairs, off of bikes, walking across stages. He mumbles and slurs his words confusedly on a regular basis as well. He's 80, but his appearance and his cognitive ability seem like he's 95. So the left doesn't want him to run for a variety of reasons. But they don't have anybody in the bullpen. Who's, who are they going to run? Are you going to run Kamala? Are you kidding? Are you going to run... You know, and Gavin Greasy Newsom, never, not, not a million years. The state of California is an absolute cesspool. cesspool. The state of California is a hellscape, and he's responsible for it. What are they going to do? They've got no choice but to ride or die, and in, no pun intended here, I mean, or no offense intended, rather, but in Joe Biden's case, it might actually come to that, but they're going to ride or die with Joe Biden. And... Maybe they're terrified that Trump would actually beat him this time. So I don't know which one it is, but I do know that the question has to be asked. Are they going after Trump with this indictment to add to the indictment in Manhattan in the porn star hush money case in a ridiculous maneuver by overstuffed Alan, Alvin, overstuffed Alvin Bragg? You know, so now that's two. There's going to be another indictment coming from Georgia. 
And will, will that be enough? Will it be three? Are they doing that to destroy Donald Trump's chances or to cement his chances of becoming the nominee because they think they can beat him? I want your thoughts. I want your answer. I want your reaction to that. Uh, this, is, this is a very dark time in America. It's a very dark time when, when you actually have to ask the question, should we jail our rival or, or and indict a former president, or should we rally support for him because we know we can cheat him and beat him a second time? It's a very, very dark time. 877-243-7776 is the number. That's 8 Prager 776. I welcome you. I'm Bob France in for Dennis Prager on the Dennis Prager Show. Let's hear you on this Free For All Friday. You know, I've come to expect the worst um, that you can get from today's American left. Not that yesterday's was a ton better, but they're more brazen now in their hatred for Donald Trump, in their creation of the double standard for Donald Trump, and that's what they've done. But it really underscores it when you do have some on the left coming to his defense. I mentioned Alan Dershowitz before, and we're going to play some of that for you in a little bit, but uh, Alan Dershowitz is a left-wing lawyer. Uh, He's a left-wing law professor. He's a retired professor, of course, Professor Emeritus, but he went on Newsmax with Dr. Gorka last night, of course, that'll be coming up on the Salem Radio Network uh, a little bit later this afternoon. But but Alan Dershowitz went on there and, and, and said, you know, unless you have something that's worse than Watergate and more leak proof, unless you have something that would bring Republicans around too to say, yeah, this is bad, we have no defense, then you cannot indict this man and force him to go through this process as we get into an election season in which he is the far and away front runner for that election. You can't do that. When you have a left-wing lawyer and law professor who said, I voted for Biden, I voted for Hillary Clinton, I've never voted for Trump, I don't like Trump, I'm not conservative, but this can't happen, that's crossing the Rubicon kind of, right? You know you've gone too far when you can't even get far-left attorneys and law professors to back your move here. That, that tells you something. So what they've done to Donald Trump by weaponizing the justice system against him back during Crossfire Hurricane in 2015 into 2016 as he was actually the President of the United States, through the two ridiculous, phony, unjust, without due process impeachment scandals, to what they're doing now. I mean, in, in all truthfulness, this is straight up election interference. There's no way to call this any overstuffed Alvin Bragg wants him sitting in a Manhattan courtroom listening to testimony about this Stormy Daniels nonsense in what? March? In March? Isn't that when they were scheduled for? I think it's in March. After all the other candidates are going to be in Iowa, New Hampshire, and doing this and that and the other thing, Donald Trump's not going to be able to go to these, uh, uh, these primary states. He's not going to be able to be uh, visible. He's going to be sitting in a courtroom. Now they're going to want him, when he's done with that hearing, get down to Miami and sit there for that one. And when that one's over, they're going to indict him and make him stay in trial in Georgia. That's, I mean, literally, this is blatant election interference. He's not going to be able to campaign. Now, he'll find a way to get his message out. He's doing it right now on Truth Social. But this is still unjust. It's unfair, and there is no justice system in America if this is allowed to go forward. And I say that, I'm not, I don't own a red MAGA hat. I don't own a red MAGA hat. I like Ron DeSantis a lot. I like Tim Scott a lot. I'm looking forward to a robust primary. I will support and campaign vociferously for the nominee. If it's Tim Scott, I'm all in. I'm going to fight for Tim Scott to win. If it's Donald Trump, I'm all in. I'm going to fight for Donald Trump to win. Okay? But we cannot allow all of the, the weapons and the tools in the Department of Justice apparatus, if you will, to be aimed at Donald Trump. It's not fair. It's not right. So I don't say this is just a, you know, red hat wearing Trump partisan, a MAGA Magadonian as as they're calling it now. I'm not do I'm doing this same way Alan Dershowitz as a leftist is doing this. 
because it's what's right. We rally around Donald Trump here because it's what's right, even if he's not your preferred candidate. And I don't have a preferred candidate because I like a bunch of these guys, and I'm not endorsing in the, in the uh, primary, but I sure as hell I'm going to fight with every fiber of my being on radio airwaves, on my program in Cleveland, Ohio, when I host, when I host Dennis Prager, when I host America First for Sebastian Gorka, any of these opportunities I have, I'm going to fight for our nominee. But our nominee must be chosen by us. It cannot be chosen by Merrick Garland. We cannot allow Joe Biden or Merrick Garland or the American political left media to choose our nominee for us by trying to either disqualify Donald Trump from being that nominee, or, as I asked you in the last segment, the two questions, or the uh, two choices here, or um, force Donald Trump to be our nominee by generating so much anger and rage against the system that people support Donald Trump and they wouldn't have, ensuring that he's the nominee. We get to make that decision. Republicans get to make that decision. We cannot allow the opponents to decide who our nominee is. And that is what I need to hear from you. Two, or no, I almost gave you the local phone number. 877-243-7776. That's 8 Prager 776 We go to the phones next. Just when you thought it couldn't get any better, Mike Lindell with MyPillow is launching the MyPillow 2.0. When Mike invented my pillow, it had everything you could ever want in a pillow. Now, nearly 20 years later, he discovered a new technology that makes it even better. The My Pillow 2.0 has the patented adjustable fill of the original My Pillow, and now with a brand new fabric that is made with a temperature regulating thread. The My Pillow 2.0 is the softest, smoothest, and coolest pillow you'll ever own. For my listeners, the My Pillow 2.0 is buy one get one free offer with promo code Prager. MyPillow 2.0 temperature regulating technology is 100% made in the USA and comes with a 10-year warranty and a 60-day money-back guarantee. Just go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listeners square to the buy one, get one free offer. Enter promo code Prager or call 800-761-6302 to get your MyPillow 2.0 now. Okay. We can do that. Bring in a little funk to the Friday. That's good. Six minutes after the hour, hour number two is underway on the Dennis Prager Show. Thank you for being with us. I'm Bob France. I'm in Cleveland, Ohio, the ReliefFactor.com studios. Uh, I want to invite you to follow me. I'm on Twitter at France Rants, F-R-A-N-T-Z, Rants, R-A-N-T-Z. You can also find me on Facebook, Bob France. You can also find me on Truth Social, Always Right WHK. That's the name of my program here in Cleveland, Ohio. It's Always Right Radio, Always Right Radio. And you can take that either way that you wish. And you can uh, follow me and listen to me uh, weekdays from 9 until noon Eastern time at whkradio.com if you are so interested. But it's an honor to be in for Dennis Prager as he continues on his listener tour. So we're going to pivot away from the Trump discussion right now of the indictment. We're going to talk about the culture war that's going on in our country. What they are doing to our kids has been obviously, you know, coming for some time. They they started this a long time ago. It has gone on steroids in the last couple of years. The indoctrination of our kids in a number of ways, not the least of which is the intent, intentional transing of America and the transing of our kids and the confusing of our kids and the indoctrination of our kids. So we're pushing back against it. We're fighting back against it. And I want to have a conversation now with a guy who is doing a lot more to fight back against it. His name is Kyle Reyes. Um, give this a listen. I'm Kyle. And as of this week, I officially identify as an angry papa bear. And I know many of you do as well. See, here's the thing. I was perfectly content hanging out with my wife and kids, running my businesses, cooking some steaks, going to church, and honestly, staying completely out of local politics. But then the educators decided that it was their job not to teach, but to indoctrinate. They decided that it was perfectly acceptable now, all of a sudden, to talk to little kids, children, about sexuality without the permission of their parents. They told kids that boys could change their bodies and become girls, and girls could become they. Which, on behalf of everyone with a brain, is plural. See what I mean? They stopped educating. 
They've done that for a long time. They stopped educating a long time ago, but it has crossed the Rubicon for our guest now, Kyle Reyes, who joins us again. Kyle is the CEO of the Silent Partner Marketing. He's a Christian, a husband, a father, and a patriot by way of his biography uh, in his profile, his online profile. He is also now the founder of AmericanDads.org. He joins us on AM 1420, The Answer. Kyle, good to have you back, my friend. How are you, sir? I'm good. Good morning. How are you, brother? So it took your kids being shown a video in their Connecticut public school class for, uh, classroom for you to say enough is enough. Tell me what they exposed your kids to, Kyle. Yeah, so in the video, the principal um, stood in front of a pride flag for morning announcements mm-hmm. and made all of the students watch a 45-second long video about how uh, kids get to call the shots about what they are. You're a boy, you feel like a girl, you can be a girl. You're a girl, you feel like a they, you can be a they. But, but this was just the straw that broke the camel's back. This has been a long time coming and building and building. There have been issues growing within the schools, not just our school, but schools across the country. And so finally, we said enough. We're done. You know, this has been going on for a while. I'm focusing on it now because it's quote-unquote Pride Month. I've changed the name of June to Groom. It's Groom uh, 9, 2023, and we're doing this all, all month long. But but this is obviously 12 months a year, and this has been, on, been going on for a few years now where it's been kind of put on steroids. Um People are pushing back at their local school boards. People are pu- pushing back by taking their kids out and trying to find charter schools or private schools that won't do this stuff. Too often they find themselves forcing uh, forcing themselves to go into homeschooling situations because they, there is just nothing else available. Um, tell me what your response is. What are you doing with your kids now that you've yanked them from that woke uh, Connecticut public school? So thank God I have a wife who is much smarter and more patient than I am. Uh, she's going to be homeschooling them. And uh, we, we at this point aren't backing down. And we're not backing down because this isn't about us or our kids. I mean, it is, right? For, for every family, it's about your kids and your family first. But nobody is standing up and fighting for kids across the country. That's why we launched AmericanDads.org, because I'm sick and tired of people sitting on their butts on the sidelines saying, this doesn't happen to my community. I'm in a conservative community. Well, guess what? My community is super conservative. And this was happening right under our noses. And I came back home from a business trip to Florida with dozens and dozens of messages, people saying, hey, you've got to go to the media. You have to talk. You've got to post about this. You have to let everybody know about this. And I said, why me? Well, what do you mean I have to? Why don't you do it? You have kids there, too. And they said, because we'll get canceled. I'll lose my job. My kids will be retaliated against in the school. And, I mean, to their point, we're going to pull our kids and so we're not worried about the retaliation and the left has been trying to dox and cancel me for years and it's actually just helped my business and so i finally said all right lord send me we're, we're in the fight my wife and i are are uh, going to take this position on the hill and fight Kyle, you're um, you're you're a leader. Uh, you're a natural born leader. From my interactions with you, both on the air and privately, and and I love that fact. And you don't care about being quote unquote canceled. It's hard though for people who aren't you and who aren't in a position, you know, an entrepreneurial position like yours. What advice do you have for angry papa bears like yourself, like me, for example? You know, I'll call, I'll, I'll join the crowd. I'll call myself an angry papa bear. The left will call me a homophobe. They'll call me a transphobe. They'll call me a bigot. They call me everything but a man of God, to be honest with you. And um, it doesn't bother me that much. It bothers my family. It bothers my wife. It bothers my kids. They don't like their dad to be viewed as being some sort of a bigot. But it comes with the territory if we stand up for what is right. So what advice do you have for other papa bears who, who, who either they themselves or their family worry about what is done to them well forget advice brother i'm going to ask him a question if not now then when what is the breaking point at what point do you say i have had enough at what point do you say i'm going to fight back and at what point is it too late you know i pointed out in one of our local groups that anyone who feels that it is appropriate to be having a conversation with little children in third grade about sexuality and it is not their parent doesn't belong around little kids that is grooming right and i was told well well you're you are just a homophobe a racist a sexist you know the whole line and i said well i'm of the belief that anyone talking to children about sex that's not their parent that we are now having a conversation about grooming and pedophilia and i actually had people come out of the woodwork publicly in our town say, let's be clear, there's a very big difference between pedophilia and being a minor attractive person. What? What? 
I mean, are we, we, here's what this comes down to. We have been sitting around in a pot of water on a low burn, and we are now coming to a boil. And we are having conversations where people are actively trying to normalize pedophilia by calling themselves minor attracted people, saying it's not a crime unless you act on it. What has happened to society? And at what point do, as parents, we say enough is enough? We are fighting for the hearts and souls of innocent children, and if we're not going to fight for them, who is? Yeah, that's a great point. So so how do we fight back with AmericanDads.org? Tell me what the organization does. I'm looking at the website. I love it. I've already filled out my information on it, so I'm with you. Uh, we're signing the pledge. What is it What, what is it we're hoping to accomplish? Yeah, so a, a couple things. Honestly, we, we throw up the website in anger more than anything else. In okay, let's put something up there. Let's give people a way to get involved. Let's gather their information. We're not going to sell it. I don't feel we don't do that. We're going to be in communication with them about what the next steps are and how they can get involved locally. So we had um, Align Us reach out. It's a new app where parents can go rate um, their schools, their school boards, books on how woke or conservative it is. Mm-hmm. Free app. People could go download it. We need to start exposing what's going on. We, you know, our kids were being read in the classroom books about transgender crayons and racist white police officers and families of illegal immigrants that feel like they're being discriminated against. And we had no idea because the schools didn't tell us. In a conservative community, the schools did not tell us. What else are they doing that they didn't tell us? And my wife put it best. But she said, if this was so crucial and so important and so imperative that we had to make the kids watch this video, this is such an important topic that kids need to learn about it, then why is it not important enough to tell the parents about? And so parents need to start having those conversations at home, but they need to start exposing the schools, asking questions, understand what's happening in the school libraries. We're all being called book banners, right? There are books that are in these school libraries in your communities, people, that are exposing kids to graphic porn. Now, we're not talking about the, the cherry-picked books that, that, you know, the left says, oh, this is no big deal. We're talking about books that give graphic, visual descriptions about things like oral sex in the elementary school classroom. So you need to get loud and vocal. And then what we're doing through that website, AmericanDads.org, is any of the donations that come in, we partnered with a PAC, and all of those funds are going to be used for parents, conservative parents, who are running for local boards of education who need help in getting elected because we can't sit on the sidelines any longer. That is a home run. That is a huge, huge answer to the question. And that's what we're going to continue to push. I've got another a segment with uh, Kyle Reyes coming up. If you are interested in that website, uh, please log on to AmericanDads.org, AmericanDads.org. If you're in the fight with us, if you're an angry papa bear and you want to join those mama bears, uh, by all means, let's do that. Bob France in for Dennis Prager right back. Okay, 20 minutes past the hour. Bob France sitting in for Dennis Prager. Let's continue the conversation now with Kyle Reyes of AmericanDads.org. We're talking to Kyle Reyes, if you just heard us on. Kyle is the CEO of the Silent Partner Marketing. He's also known as the Chief Snowflake Melter. It says so on his business card, which I absolutely love. <laughs> but, 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 Kyle, first of all, the fact that we're raising money through AmericanDads.org to support candidates for local school boards to get these woke uh, indoctrinators off of those boards is huge. But I'll tell you something else that I love about this. The database that's collected here, people, you know, like you said, you're not selling information. But when people look and see how fast it's grown, you only put it up, what, yesterday? There's over 5,000 yep. 5, names on it already. It lets guys, in, and you don't have to be popular, you can be a mama bear too. It lets people know that they're not alone. It lets be, because it's hard to be called a, a transphobe or a bigot or somebody who doesn't care about the feelings of others, blah, blah, blah when you're alone, but if you are in a room full of people that are saying the same thing, you feel emboldened. And when you're in a room, when you're in a, in, in a community full of people who feel the same way, you're emboldened even more. Emboldened to stand up for your kids, not to harm anyone, not to, not to point fingers and not to attack and not to call names, but to defend your kids against this indoctrination. When people know there are thousands, if not millions of other people just like them, that's how we begin the fight back. Uh, and, and if you can do that through American Dads, uh, AmericanDads.org, if nothing else, that will help the cause. Well, and if I can, I'd like to give a message to the dads that are out there, which is that, and I include myself in this, 
we as husbands and as fathers, we have failed. We have failed to stand up and stand by our wives and stand by the mothers of our children and fight for these kids because they cannot do it alone. We are called to be leaders. We are called to lead our, our homes, our communities, our families. We are called to be protectors. And, and I don't say that in any kind of a sexist way. I mean, my, my wife would kick someone's butt better than I could, right? But it's our responsibility. It's our God-given duty to stand up and fight and protect our loved ones. And we have sat there saying, well, I'm, I'm busy, right? i got to provide for the family. i got to work. i got stuff to do. You know, I don't want to lose my job. And we have failed to lead. We have failed to take action. And, and our wives and the mothers of our children, they need us. They can't do this alone. They can't fight this battle alone. We have a duty to our children and our brides to stand by their side, to be their partners, and to give them the love and the energy and the support and encouragement that they need to know that they're not the only ones fighting for our innocent kids anymore. Perfectly stated. And, and, you know, if we do this right, um, talk about being partners with our brides and the mothers of our children. One year from now, the Southern Poverty Law Center will also include AmericanDads.org alongside Moms for Liberty as a hateful extremist group. You saw that they did that to Moms for Liberty just this week. Yep. I, I mean, listen, this week we made local community lists of uh, businesses not to do business with. Um, I mean, it was put out there publicly on all the local forums, which I think is funny because I have nine companies, right? People don't know eight of them. My main company, a marketing agency, I promise you that unemployed liberals are not going to be hiring our marketing agency in our local community anytime soon anyway. But but this is what they do, right? Like, we're a little bit sheltered from it. We're blessed to be in a position where cancel culture and I are, like, buddies. Like, they've been trying to cancel me since before it was a thing, since before it was cool. But most people are terrified of it. They're terrified of losing their jobs. They're terrified of losing their homes. I get it. I respect it. So find a new way to get in the fight. Go to, you know, download Align Us and, and start letting people know what schools and what school boards and what curriculums and what books are woke. You know, join us on AmericanDads.org and, and get in the fight. You don't have to be a public loudmouth like me to get in the fight to preserve the hearts and souls of innocent children. No, you don't have to be, but it helps. It helps to be as much of a loudmouth as you can be. Whether you have a massive platform or a smaller platform, it really does help to be vocal again because it shows other people that they're not alone, and it gives them encouragement as well. And uh, as I was saying, it's a badge of honor for Moms again, uh, Moms for Liberty to be designated a hate group by the left-wing uh, Southern Poverty Law Center. They've done their jobs, and now American Dads, I hope they come for us too because that means we're doing our jobs. Last thing, Kyle Reyes, um, this is, speaking of leadership, this is the President of the United States yesterday. I want you to respond to this. Violence and... Let's try that again from the top. It's wrong that the violence and hate crimes targeting LGBTQ people is rising. It's wrong that extreme officials are pushing hateful bills targeting transgender children, terrifying families, and criminalizing doctors. These are our kids. These are our neighbors. It's cruel and it's callous. Not somebody else's kids. They're all our kids. I could talk for an hour straight on just that little 25-second uh, clip, but, Kyle, you do it. Well, <clears throat> first of all, I think they've got to balance his meds back out, right? I mean, the guy sounds like he's dead to begin <laughs> with. I'm, I'm not really sure what's going on there. Uh, and it's, it's a shame. He's being propped up like a puppet. This is elder abuse at this point. But I digress. You know, I'll share with you a quick story. So one of the parents reached out to me and said their kid has a speech impediment, and all of the other kids in the school were making fun of him, saying he was gay. And he's not gay. So he went to that principal in question in all of this and said, I'm being pushed around and beat up and made fun of. They're saying that I'm gay and I'm not gay. And the principal scolded him and said, it's okay to be gay. You're allowed to be gay. Don't worry about it. Send him back to class. Next day, he got into a fist fight. He got suspended because he was being called gay again. Who, who are we protecting? Is it just the point zero 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 one percent of children that we're actually grooming and intentionally confusing and, and perhaps telling someone who might have been a tomboy that now they're boxed into this position and they actually have to remove their healthy breast tissue and become a boy? Is that who we're protecting? Because it sounds to me like we're protecting groomers and not innocent children. So at this point, the way that this administration has continued to move forward is by gaslighting. They're not protecting anybody. They're working in overtime to protect groomers and pedophiles and, I'm sorry, minor attracted people.
Exactly right. And the only kids, truthfully, who are not being protected in schools, in stories like yours and elsewhere uh, elsewhere across this country, are the kids who don't want to call John Jane, and the kids who don't want to say she or he or Z or Zay or they or them to, to, to single kids whose, whose uh, uh, sexual identity is very, very obvious and plain to see. Kids who just want to be normal are the ones who need to be protected because they're the ones who are being attacked if they do not fall into line with the indoctrina- indoctrination. And that's... And I- um, that's where we as dads come in. We have to stand up for our kids. So Kyle Race is founded now, AmericanDads.org. <clears throat> I want to steer people there. I've already signed up. I've taken the pledge. Uh, and uh, there's now over 5,000 people who have signed it in about a day. Hopefully we'll be at 20,000 by the end of the weekend or uh, maybe even more than that. But let people know that you're there. Uh, donate money if you can. If you can, you heard Kyle. This is not a profit-making scheme. This is to donate funds to conservative parents who want to join school boards and try to restore some sense of sanity to the education system that has become the indoctrination factory of American public schools. Kyle Reyes, thank you for what you're doing, my friend. God bless you for that work and uh, let's stay in touch thank you brother god bless take care everybody thank you there you go that's kyle reyes he's uh he's a patriot and uh and a, and a very very strong voice for dads he's a public loudmouth, and uh so am i and i'm happy to be so and if that comes with the slings and arrows of people who want to condemn me then so be it uh you gotta have some thick skin you gotta be willing to fight the fight but i'll tell you what if we don't fight the fight we lose the war that's reality we'll be back it, 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 you know, if we don't fight the fight, we lose the war. How can you win a war if you aren't willing to fight the battles? Uh, I welcome your thoughts and your reaction to that. And especially if you're a papa bear, an angry papa bear wanting to protect your kids the way Kyle does and the way I do, uh, dial us up 8 Prager 776, 8 Prager 776. Your call's next. So we're going to go back to the phones. <clears throat> Bob France sitting in for Dennis, if you just tuned in for this Free for All Friday. We had a great conversation with Kyle Reyes of AmericanDads.org. Join me, by the way. I signed that up first thing this morning when I saw it. Go to AmericanDads.org, sign the pledge. And if you can, donate to the cause. Completely, 100% charitable to go to the campaigns of conservatives running for school boards. That's it. How do we take back the education system from the indoctrinators? We replace the school board members. We can't replace the teachers. Got to have a degree, got to have a master's degree and all the other. But we can replace the people who hire and approve the teachers. And we can replace those who push the ridiculous indoctrinational uh, curricula on our kids. We can replace them at the school board level by running. So support that cause at AmericanDads.org. We'll go to the phones. We're going to talk to Tommy, who's calling us from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Tommy, Bob France sitting in for Dennis. You're on the air. Fire away. Hey, Bob. You're a patriot. Um, you know, we we got to stop calling them Democrats and, and call them what they are. we got to call them socialists. The, the word Democrat it never leaves my mouth anymore. Whenever I talk to the few people that I know, neighbors that are socialists, that's what I call them socialist i call him comrade when they start calling me a trumpy or a butchie yeah, yeah. <laughs> i like okay, that comrade yeah we gotta stop <laughs> yeah, calling the, the only Democrats. time i the only time i call them democrats is if i replace the c with an n take the c in democrat and replace it with an n and tell me what you get democrat demon demon rat <laughs> replace oh, the c rat. with an n it's one letter away demon <laughs> rat and I think that best yeah, describes that's a good them. One. Yeah, that, that's you the way I do it. But I agree with you. They, the are, they are socialists. You they fell on the fly, and I'm a carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> like well, you know what, my friend? God bless you for being a carpenter. I could never do what you do. Uh, my house would fall apart. My roof would leak forever if I tried to put something together with two pieces of wood. The fact that you can do what you do means you are, you're my hero, my friend. You're my hero. And when the time comes, I'd be calling you to do the work. So uh, you're, you're better off. Uh, no, in all seriousness, I agree with you. The modern Democrat Party, the modern demon rat party, is indeed made up of socialists and cultural Marxists. And, yeah, 
those who refuse to, you know, join us in holding China accountable, let's go ahead and just call them communists, too. I have no problem with that whatsoever. I say those things to people's faces, and I will say those things and defend them to the hilt. If you know what communism is, if you know what Marxism is, if you know what cultural Marxism is, and yes, socialism, they're all, you know, very, very thinly separated from one another. They all fit the modern demon rat party. Um, Neil is in Prescott, Arizona. Neil, you're on the Dennis Prager Show. Bob France sitting in. Fire away. Should LGBT uh, alphabet soup uh, people like my brother that was gay allowed to own guns? He did have a permit. And it was interesting. He's also Republican and didn't like this attitude that human rights have been bent around to make inhuman rights. Well, you're you're right to uh, to a degree. Let me address try to uh, try to address all of that. Um, should should LBGTQ people be allowed to be armed? Well, of course. Are they American citizens? There's nothing in the Second Amendment that I see that says you have to be of a certain sexual orientation or be heterosexual or something to own guns. So of course they can. As far as human rights, um, yeah, you better believe uh, we stand up for human rights. And right now, the only human rights that are under attack are not those of the LGBTQ community. The human rights that are under attack right now are for normalized, not normalized, what am I saying? Normal, straight people who don't give a rip who you want to go have sex with. Normal people who recognize human biology and recognize that there are men and there are women and there is no third option. Normal human sexual orientation, which is what has led to every human being ever being produced, a heterosexual union. That does not mean you're anti-gay, and it does not mean you're anti-human rights. The people whose rights are being taken away are the people who, who just wish to be left alone and instead are being forced to celebrate with rainbows everywhere they go. I'll talk more about that after this. Bob Branson for News. So it's uh, 17 minutes now before the top of the hour. Bob France in for Dennis on this Friday. Thanks for being with us. So I get a kick out of the suggestion, kind of like what I think the last caller, who was a fairly obvious troll, was trying to ask, you know, should gay people be allowed to have guns as if this is some sort of question? And also to suggest that this is some sort of an anti-gay position that people who are against grooming of children take. It is not. As a matter of fact, one of the organizations that I have an extraordinary amount of respect for is a gay organization called Gays Against Groomers. They are active. They're in communities. They're at school board meetings. They're at town, town council meetings. They're all over the place trying to say we're gay and we do not condone bringing children to drag shows where sexualized dancing of, of hairy men or even shaven men in women's clothing is pushed on kids. We do not condone and support books that are either literally meaning, uh, 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 in, let me rephrase that, not literally, but pornographic literature and pornographic depictions of gay sex are, are in children's books and put on shelves in schools and in libraries, decorated with rainbows, which, of course, naturally draw kids' attention. You know that, right? That's why they chose the rainbow. I've talked about this before on Dennis's show. That's why they chose the rainbow as their symbol. It's an easy way to draw kids' attention. Uh, their, their attention is drawn to the bright colors. Uh, it's why every kindergarten classroom has always been decorated in bright colors, even before this rainbow mafia came about, because it draws kids. It's just that... You know, back when we were in school, back in, you know, in previous decades, the rainbow that drew kids was a symbol of God's eternal covenant with man. Now it means, hey, look at, uh, look at us. We like to have uh, different types of sex than normal people do or hetero people do. This is not about gays because gays against groomers doesn't like this stuff either. They're on our side. But I love it when they try to say that, you know, oh, you're violating human rights by, by pushing these bills. I just played the clip of Joe Biden during the conversation with uh, Kyle Reyes of Joe Biden saying, you know, these e evil bills are being pushed by these extremist legislators and targeting LGBT kids. No, they're not. These bills are targeting LGBT kids only in the sense that they are trying to protect and save these kids from horrific, horrific repercussions of their decisions at a young age. You understand that? 
If you follow me on Twitter, what you'll see right now, the most recent tweet that I posted was about 10 minutes ago during one of our breaks. I'm on Twitter at France Rants, F-R-A-N-T-Z, France Rants, R-A-N-T-Z, right? I'll just look for Bob France. You'll see a picture, and my caption is, bet you don't know what this is. And what it is, it's a picture of a forearm. It's a picture of a girl's forearm that is mutilated, that has been harvested, where the flesh and the skin have been harvested in order to create a fake phallus, a fake penis, so that this confused girl could could pretend that she is a male by having a surgically grafted on hunk of her forearm grafted down into her crotch to create a fake penis. And the answer to the question of bet you don't know what this is, is, is you're supposed to, I want you to understand that that's a penis in the confused mind of some of these kids. I'm going to share something with you here. Um, I hope it doesn't mess up my call screen, but I'm going to play something for you here that you probably recall from a while back. This was from when Kamala Harris was still running for president, I believe, back in 2019. Kamala Harris was asked about 18 to 24-year-olds, the younger voting crowd, right? And this is what Kamala Harris said. Believe me, I'm going somewhere with this, but let me see if you can hear this. Remember, age is more than a chronological fact. What else do we know about this population, 18 through 24? They are stupid. (laughs) That is why we put them in dormitories and they have a resident assistant. They make really bad decisions. Now, why did I play that? 18 to 24 year olds, according to the current vice president of the United States, are stupid, who make really bad decisions. And she's not wrong. The brain doesn't fully form and function until you're around 26 years old. Particularly for males, it's a little later. But she said 18 to 24-year-olds are stupid, and they make really bad decisions. And she's right. So if 18 to 24-year-olds make really bad decisions because they're stupid, what do 8 to 10-year-olds make? What kind of decisions do 11 to 13-year-olds make? What kind of decisions do these children, without their frontal lobes being developed, what kind of decisions do they make? Should they be able to make life-altering decisions? You know, like, well, the picture that I just told you about that you can find on Twitter. Look for Bob France, F-R-A-N-T-Z. They make those kinds of decisions. They have their bodies mutilated. They have their, their breasts surgically removed. Voluntarily, not talking about those racked with cancer. Voluntary, chosen, double mastectomies. Because in their confused minds or in their, in their um, socially contagion addled minds, they decided they wanted to be males. You know, there are, there's a multitude of psychological conditions and disorders. You can you'd look them all up if you want. But unless I'm mistaken, and I don't think that I am, the treatment for psychological disorders in every single one of the cases is psychological treatment. Right? Psychological treatment for psychological disorders. Well, gender dysphoria is a psychological condition. It is the only psychological disorder that I'm aware of, for which physical mutilation is the treatment. You have a problem with your brain. Your mind can't reconcile with what your body is, what your chromosomes are, what your every cell in your body is, but your mind is confused about that. So rather than heal your mind the way we do any other psychological condition, we're going to mutilate your body. It's, It's a remarkable thing. And yet these people tell us human rights aren't being respected. No, human rights mean saving people from decisions like those. We'll be back.
Hour number three of the Dennis Prager Show is underway. <clears throat> Welcome once again, Bob Brand sitting in for Dennis Lee, live here in Cleveland, Ohio, the ReliefFactor.com studio. So I told you before the break, you're going to want to hear this conversation. Dr. Scott Gerber is a professor of law at Ohio Northern University, and he is fighting for his professional life now. This is an interview that you want to hear. Let's bring him on. Dr. Gerber, good morning. It's good to have you on the program. How are you, sir? Good morning, Bob. Thank you. I'm doing okay under the circumstances. Give us um, give us the background here. I, I read just the very beginning of your article, this op-ed that you wrote for the Wall Street Journal, April 14th, so we're talking just a couple of months now that you've been dealing with this. Tell us what happened to you. Yeah, okay. Well, first of all, the Wall Street Journal found out about it and asked me if I would write an article. I didn't just write one and sim- submit it over the transom. But what happened was, on April 14th, which is a Friday, I was teaching my constitutional law class, and that runs from noon until 1. And right as we were wrapping up, uh, several campus security officers come into the room, walk down to the front at the, to the lectern where I am, and whisper into my ear something to the effect of, you're a respected member of the campus community, please follow us quietly to the dean's office. And so, of course, I was confused and frightened, and uh, I looked into the classroom, and my students also looked confused and frightened. And so then they escorted me up the stairs, and some of them were, uh, some of the students were in the aisle, so I had to squeeze through them in a perp walk. And right at the door um, uh, outside of the classroom were armed uh, uh, aid of town police, and then they then followed me into the dean's suite and then uh, took me into the dean's office, and the armed town police and the campus security uh, remained in the dean's suite to guard it. And so then when I was in the dean's suite, he handed me a two-page piece of paper and said if I don't sign it in a week, he's going to institute dismissal proceedings against me. And um, I didn't know what I was alleged to have done wrong, and I asked him multiple times, and I recorded the meeting with the dean, and uh, so I have that evidence, and there was also an officer in the room, and he overheard it, so I, multiple times I said, what, I'm, what am I accused of doing? He wouldn't tell me, and so he then banishes me from the campus with three weeks left to go and final exams, so it adversely impacted my students' educational experience. Not only did it scare them, but it also impacted them, and so I've been banished ever since. We're talking with Dr. Scott Gerber. He's a law professor at Ohio Northern University in Ada. <clears throat> I went to Heidelberg College, so I'm very familiar with your university. Um, before I ask you for a bit of a, a summary explanation of what was on that two-page paper they wanted you to, to, to sign, can you tell me, in your opinion, Dr. Gerber, why they had to come and get you while you were in the middle of class? I'm going to assume you have office hours during the day. I'm going to assume you, even if you teach, say, three classes a day, you're out of class a lot more on campus than you are in class. They couldn't come and get you privately and say, we need to talk to you and come on down to the dean's office. That's number one. And number two, that they had to have armed ADA police along with campus security? I mean, were you accused of a violent crime that I'm not aware of? Of course not. I, I've, I've never been in a fight in my life. Um, why, why do you they think did. they would need that show of force, of armed security to come and talk to somebody that they have a problem with? And like I said, it's the kind of walk, I called it a perp walk, because um, it's got to be embarrassing to be walking out of your class with these armed officers, or actually with these campus security officers, then the armed police waiting for you. Um, I, they, they, they were putting you on display. They were. Sh- it sounds to me like they were showing everybody you do not mess with this university. Why do you think they did it in such a public way? I think they did it for that reason, and they also did it to humiliate me publicly and to frighten me into signing that release of claims document. And one other uh, point about the document, because I'm over 40, under federal age discrimination law, they were required to give me 21 days to consider the document, to consult attorneys and things like that. And even if I had signed it, which I did not, I would have seven days to change my mind. But they only gave me seven, so they already violated age discrimination law. And uh, so, you know, one, I've gotten a lot of um, support from uh, professional groups and, and, and individuals and the like. 
and the American Association of University Professors, which is the most important uh, faculty uh, rights group in the, in the country. And they're on the left, by the way, and I'm not on the left. But they nevertheless have written the university twice, and they're going to write them again. And they were very, very upset that I was banished from the campus uh, with no hearing at all, because that then poisons the campus against me and then makes it impossible for me to get a fair hearing. And so that, so, so that's, that's why they did it. Dr. Gerber, um, tell me about the paper they gave you that they wanted you to sign. They wanted you to try. I think they tried to probably disorient you and confuse you and frighten you and intimidate you into signing something right away. What was on that two-page paper? Yeah, the only uh, uh, accusation was uh, inadequate collegiality. And so they were going to terminate me for, for inadequate collegiality. And, of course, Is in the faculty scale? handbook, yeah, um, in the faculty handbook, Hello? Yeah, I apologize. Continue. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, in, in the in the faculty handbook, uh, insufficient collegiality isn't even listed as a grounds for termination. So they used armed police and humiliated me and all of that uh, to try to terminate me for a ground that, one, isn't true, but, two, isn't even listed as a reason that you can terminate a tenured professor. And any termination would have to be for really horrific things, and they list six or seven things. And one of these outside groups pointed this out. The American Council of Trustees and an alumni pointed out that you're terminating this guy or trying to for something that's not even listed in in the handbook. And um, But they just think they can do whatever they want, and the rules and the law don't apply to them. So that term was on that paper, inadequate collegiality. And I'm curious as to what the scale is for collegiality. How does one assign, is it a 1 through 10 and you have to be above a 7? But we determined you'd only be at a 5 on collegiality. I mean, honestly, it's, it's, it sounds like the most ridiculous thing that I've ever heard. They are grasping at straws to try to remove you without any just cause whatsoever. And they didn't tell you, which is bad enough, but you said in your article that you wrote for the Wall Street Journal, you suspect why. And it does have to do with the viewpoint diversity you requested. Tell us more about that. Right. Um, uh, uh, last year, I was uh, unanimously elected in the fall by my uh, uh, university faculty uh, colleague, essentially vice president of the faculty. In our system, it's called vice chair of the university council. So they thought highly of me. And so in that capacity, it's my job to raise concerns about things that the administration is trying to do. And like a lot of colleges and universities, they're pushing this DEI uh, material. And so I politely at a council meeting raised my hand and said, please remember to also address viewpoint diversity. And so the administration looked like I was from another planet. You know, essentially, uh, the impression I was getting was how could anyone think differently on something like that? And then the president herself, on two separate occasions, says that said that viewpoint diversity would not would not be part of our DEI initiative. And on that point, by the way, just amazingly to me, uh, Governor Mike DeWine was interviewed on the radio yesterday by one of your colleagues in Cincinnati, and he was asked about this. And he said that he had read an article about it, and he wanted to make sure that the colleges and universities in Ohio did value viewpoint diversity, did allow students and faculty to think differently from one another and from what he called the the, the overwhelmingly left perspective on these things. But at my university, they didn't allow it. Yeah, what a novel concept, and I'm glad that the governor of Ohio has taken that position. I'm not always a big fan of Republican Governor Mike DeWine, our governor here in the state of Ohio. He far too often governs like a Democrat. I sometimes call him a trans Democrat because it seems like he's transitioning into one. He just isn't isn't aware of his own identity yet. Uh, but um, but I'm glad that he is standing up for uh, for Professor Gerber. I've got another you know, a segment to talk about uh, uh, Scott Gerber's 
uh, future with Ohio Northern University, and I'm going to welcome your phone calls when we're done. 8 Prager 776. Tell me how you feel about this, and tell me if you think there's ever going to be true um, viewpoint diversity on Ohio's or in uh, any college campus across this country, whether it be a law school or otherwise. 8 Prager 776. We'll continue with Dr. Scott Gerber coming up right after this. Okay, we continue now with Professor Scott Gerber at Ohio Northern University. And, Professor, tell us more about how you expressed your thoughts on viewpoint diversity. I had written a couple of op-eds on this point. I had given a TV interview on this point. And um, in prior years, I had pushed back against illegal hiring practices, for example, in the law school a couple of years ago. We had a hiring process where we had six finalists and not one of them was a white male. And so I asked, how heavily are you taking race, gender, and ethnicity into account? And they uh, didn't tell the truth about it. And then finally they admitted they took it into account. And then in our accrediting documents, to appease the accreditors, they say we're not only taking it into account, but we're emphasizing it, emphasizing it. You're not allowed to take it into account at all in hiring. And so any citizen, any employee is allowed to object to illegality. And that's all I did. When they said to you that viewpoint diversity is not part of our DIE inclusion plan, Dr. Gerber, what what did you think of that? Because you, you work, this is a university, this is an institution of higher learning where I thought that the goal was to pursue truth and to consider all viewpoints in the in the pursuit of knowledge. Does it make any sense to you to say, no, we are not going to consider other viewpoints, we are only going to consider viewpoints that we come up with or we agree with? Of course it doesn't make sense, and more important, it doesn't make sense to me, but more importantly, it also it didn't make sense to the governor of the state of Ohio. And as I said, he, he said that explicitly yesterday on the radio. But in terms of what happened when they said that at the meeting, you know, when the meeting was adjourning, I looked to a, you know, a colleague on the university council and I just, we couldn't believe that they would say that, but we, we know that's their mindset. Uh, most people at Ohio Northern, most people on the faculty and the staff, they're terrified. It's a culture of fear. And so people are afraid to speak out. But I thought my record was so strong. I mean, it's really strong. I don't want to brag, and I don't want to bore your listeners by reciting my record. But it's very strong. And I also have tenure, so I thought that would allow me to push back politely and state my concerns about the need for viewpoint diversity and also my concerns when these DEI programs drift into illegality, which is what they have done at my university. Dr. Gerber, um, I reached out to um, apparently a mutual acquaintance of yours, uh, Peter Kersenow, who is, of course, the uh, longest serving member on the United States Commission on Civil Rights. I would think that this would be of interest to the Civil Rights Commission. Have you had correspondence with them? And um, is there any is there any movement there? Um, I haven't. Actually, I've been uh, I'm on the Ohio Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, and I've been on it for 15 years. And so what our committee does and various state advisory committees do is we write reports and do um, on-the-ground investigations for the U.S. Commission, and Peter is one of the commissioners. Um, So, But, no, I haven't reached out to him directly. One of the other commissioners is is apparently aware of it, and someone else had reached out to her about it, and um, – but – Maybe I should do that. I'll run that by my lawyer. Well, it's just interesting. I wonder if your administration considered the fact that the person that they were just trying to run out of his job happened to be on the Ohio Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. As they try to violate your rights simply for suggesting that they consider viewpoint diversity, uh, that this might not be a violation of your civil rights. And and as you you pointed out, I mean, when they lied to you, about not only considering but emphasizing the role of race in in you know uh, decisions that they make in terms of giving awards and so forth, do they not understand that you literally are a representative, not a representative, but again, as you say on the committee, the advisory committee for the Civil Rights Commission, you would think they would be towing the civil rights line. Um, I I think that they're acting on emotion uh, and anger, 
And I think that they thought that they would just frighten and humiliate me into signing a document in an illegally short amount of time. They didn't expect me to stand up to them, to get so much support. And I know that they could not have imagined that there'd be so much media coverage on this and that the Wall Street Journal would publish a piece on it. I mean, that's the most important newspaper in, in, in the country, that they would publish that, my piece. And, of course, because of that, everyone else has been asking me to appear and things like that. I just don't think they uh, – they, they think – I mean, you mentioned that you went to a competing school. Mm-hmm. Ada, Ohio is very rural, uh, flies under the radar, and I just think that they think that they can uh, just get a, do whatever they want and no one will notice and no one will care. Because if I had taught at Ohio State, um, uh, they probably would have thought twice about doing it. Um, Brilliant point. Brilliant point. That's right. They thought they could get away with this because nobody's paying attention to what's going on there. Nobody's going to care about a single professor in a single rural school uh, in Ada, Ohio. I think that's very well said. Just two more questions for you, uh, uh, Dr. Gerber. Do you enjoy teaching at Ohio Northern? I, I love my students. And um, and I'm you know getting a little bit choked up here for a second. The the, the 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 I mean it's it's bad enough that they're trying to end my career and ruin my life. I mean that's a terrible thing, but it, it impacted my students. And when I lifted my eyes to the room, when campus security was at the front of the room, whispering into my ear, they looked frightened. They looked frightened, and they'll never forget this. Another friend of mine said, "Scott, the, those students in that room will never forget this." In fact because it was published in this camp of this newspaper, that the law college was put on lockdown. So this was premeditated. They told the students in the other and in the campus student newspaper was it was like it was an active shooter situation. Think about that. Um, Dr. Gerber, that's mind-blowing. That's incredible that they would treat it like that. And again, in an attempt to humiliate you, I think, and to try to force One of the mm-hmm. things that, of course, I would expect is a public apology. And so one of the uh, professional groups, the National Association of Scholars, wrote to the president and said that you must issue, Scott, a uh, a public apology to try to minimize uh, the defamation that has been uh, uh, perpetrated upon him. And so things like that. And, of course, also I, I would want the people that orchestrated this to be held accountable for it. And if they're held accountable and in, 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 in to the degree that they should be, um, it, it would be much easier for me to work there. Um, perhaps doctor, they wouldn't be working there anymore. You know what? That's a great point. That's a great point. The people who tried to to carry out this, uh, you know, this attack on you and to ruin your career and defame you should be held accountable for it, and you should be able to work without uh, that kind of interference and without that kind of a uh, of a problem continuing. Uh, I just thought I'd let you know that Commissioner Kersenow is listening to this interview, and he wanted me to let you know that the uh, Conservative Caucus of the Civil Rights Commission is indeed reaching out to Governor DeWine and to the university on your behalf. Well, well thank you. And I, I, I very much appreciate that the commissioner is going to do that. Um, so thank you. This is a, an ongoing issue, I think, as everybody knows. That's, you know, it's Dr. Scott Gerber is a, a professor of law, if you didn't hear the whole thing, <clears throat> at Ohio Northern University in uh, rural Ohio in Ada, a small town called Ada. It's where the footballs are made. That's where the NFL football is made. That's where the factory is. And um, his story is not unique. His story is sadly one that is repeated in a lot of colleges all over America, and it deserves our attention. We'll be back. Well, thank you, Dennis, for that. If you can stand it, yes, you can watch me. <laughs> some, people were, some people were born for radio, others not so much. Uh, I consider myself in the former, and they put us on TV anyway. Uh, no, thank you for being with us. Uh, 8 Prager 776. We've got time for a few more phone calls in the final 16 minutes of this broadcast. Bob France sitting in for Dennis here in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, I tried to give you this before. I want to see if we can make this happen now. Uh, President Trump's response was every bit justified last night when uh, he told everybody that, yes, he was informed that the Department of Justice was indicting him and that he has to report to uh, a Miami courtroom on Tuesday. Here's what the president said. Very sadly, we're a nation in decline, and yet they go after a popular president, a president that got more votes than any sitting president 
in the history of our country by far and did much better the second time in the election than the first. And they go after him on a boxer's hoax, just like the Russia, Russia, Russia hoax and all of the others. This has been going on for seven years. They can't stop because it's election interference at the highest level. There's never been anything like what's happened. I'm an innocent man. I'm an innocent person. Uh, they had the Mueller hoax, the Mueller report, and that came out. No collusion after two and a half years. That was set up by Hillary Clinton and Democrats. But this is what they do. This is what they do so well. If they would devote their energies to honesty and integrity, it would be a lot better for our country. They could do a lot better. They could do a lot of great things. But when you look at what's happened to our country in the last three years, right. we were energy- Let's jump in here and stop that, please. I'm going to have to just make it very, very clear. You cannot use the words honesty and integrity in the same sentence with Democrats. Okay, what are you trying to do? It make atoms explode? Those things don't go together. That is an oxymoron, and I'm sorry to be so blunt about it, but everything that the president just said is true. This is what they do. They have no interest whatsoever in honesty or in justice, and when they tell you nobody is above the law, that's crap. If nobody was above the law, Joe Biden would be in handcuffs. If nobody was above the law, Hunter Biden would be in a prison cell. If nobody was above the law, Hillary Clinton would be wearing an orange jumpsuit. Don't try to tell me nobody is above the law when you have no earthly idea how to spell the word. And that's the reality. And I'm sorry that the country has gotten to the place it has. I'm sorry that we have to be so bitter. I'm sorry we have to be so hostile. I'm sorry we have to be so uh, so partisan about this. But doggone it, if there were equal applications of the law, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, Hunter Biden, and a host of others would already, it's Jim Comey, Peter Strzok, Lisa Page, they would already be in jail. And if you want to go after... Uh, Donald Trump, after doing those things, putting them in jail, I'd, all right, equal application of the law. But if you're going to tell me that all of those other people who were found credibly and proven to have done things that are far worse or at the very least as bad as what they are now accusing Trump, and they all skated and Trump has to go down, not only are they doing this uh, you know, just to the leader of the opposition party, the man who is far away the front runner for the nomination, not only are they doing that, they're doing it now intentionally because the primary season is here. The first debate is August 23rd. What's today? The 9th? So what are we talking about here? Two months, two months and a week uh, or so. <clears throat> We're talking, or two weeks. We're talking about, you know, uh, being, being very, very close to the actual primary season, and they want to tether him to courtrooms in Miami and in Manhattan and probably soon to be in Atlanta Or something, this is completely bogus, it is illegitimate, and it cannot be supported. I don't care if you hate Donald Trump or love Donald Trump, you have to recognize how wrong this is. If you don't, you're being intentionally daft. You are ignoring the reality that's before your very eyes. And I'm sorry, like I said, that it got this way. But we didn't make it this way. You lock those other people up and then you want to come for Trump, I'll say, all right, fair game is fair game. It's like Alan Dershowitz said. Left-wing Harvard Law Professor Emeritus Alan Dershowitz, who voted against Trump when he voted for Biden, who voted against Trump when he voted for Hillary Clinton, who does not like Trump, who is a left-wing lawyer. Alan Dershowitz said, unless you have something that is so rock-solid on him, so rock-solid as to bring the Republicans along with you, to, to declare that he needs to go like they did with Richard Nixon. Unless you have something that rock solid, if you're reaching and you're stretching to try to make an investigation happen in order to hurt this political rival in the middle of this uh, uh, primary season or at the beginning stages of what will stretch into the middle of the primary season, you better be rock solid. If it's even close, no, you don't bring these charges. This is a guy who doesn't like Trump, doesn't like conservatives. Even he says that. So not only are they doing this to this person when they let others skate, they waited until now. They waited until June 
of 2023, knowing that the debates start in August, knowing that the season, the full presidential season is about to begin, this is when they bring the charges on, on the uh, ridiculous uh, Stormy Daniels thing in, in Manhattan. This is when overstuffed Alvin Bragg decides to bring the charges now, and he schedules the trial for March you know, yeah, the Iowa caucuses and New Hampshire primaries, uh, sorry, you're going to have to be here. Don't tell me that this is about applying the law and nobody being above the law. You are absolutely putting people above the law. It's just that, not so, it's, just that it's your people. It's your, it's your candidates, your former secretaries of state, your former vice presidents, their family members. You put them above the law, and you wonder why we're upset. You wonder why we're hostile. I'm going to remain hostile, and I'm going to remain upset, and I'm going to remain angry until justice can be applied equally. And you know what that's going to start with? The previous caller asked me this. said, Bob, what are the Republicans in the House going to do? What are they going to do, and when are they going to do it? And you know what my answer to him was? What they damn well better be doing is preparing, gathering, collecting evidence and arguments and facts to impeach the Attorney General. All of this is being done on Joe Biden's behalf by Merrick Garland. That's it. The attorney general is a political tool rather than being the top cop in the United States of America. That's where we focus our attention. We'll be back. We, uh, we put this show together in a very, very short period of time today due to a variety of reasons that don't matter to anybody. But I want to say thank you to Sean and to Zach and to Richard and to Alan and to everybody else who had a role in putting this together. As Dennis is, of course, on his tour, he's got a cavalcade of guest hosts in for him. I've been glad to be here now. This is the second in this trip. Uh, but we put it together in short order, and we couldn't do it without professionals. So I want to say thanks to those guys. Terrific team, and it's, uh, it's an honor to sit in with them. Uh, it's our last segment. I want to take a call or two more here. Richard has been waiting ever so patiently in New Jersey to get on the air. And Richard, you are now on, although, of course, I'm not able to bring you up. Let's see if we can punch up line one. And Richard, thanks for your patience. You're on the Dennis Prager Show. Go ahead, sir. Hi. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for taking my call. While you've been on the air, uh, you may not know this. The indictment has been unsealed, and I wanted to talk to you about that for a moment. The evidence included in the now unsealed indictment uh, includes not only video of uh, Mar-a-Lago employees moving boxes of classified documents around after the subpoena and after Trump's lawyers had assured the government they had complied and returned everything, but it also includes a uh, recording of Trump acknowledging that he knew the documents were classified and also saying exactly this. I'm quoting him now in response to the FBI subpoena. Trump is recorded saying, wouldn't it be better if we just told them we don't have anything? So maybe instead of just saying it's political, it's a witch hunt, it's a hoax, that's easy. But I'm wondering if you can speak to the evidence. Can you address any of that? Well, well here, here's the thing. Um, I, I did not see any of that video, as you correctly pointed out. I'm on the air, so I have not seen this. I'll have to review this for myself. Um, but let's just, for the sake of discussion, say that everything you're saying is right, and, uh, and it's very damning, and it's something that is indictable, and that he should stand trial for all of these things. Okay. What I would say is, how is it that the, the, as we look for equal application of the law, that Joe Biden has not yet been interviewed, not one representative of the Department of Justice, no one from the FBI, he was found to have classified documents that he had no right to have in multiple locations, including very, very unsecured places, and, and not even an interview, much less an investigation, much less the indictment and the charges against him. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stipulate to you, or with you, that, that what you're saying about Trump's uh, uh, audio and videotapes are true and say, okay, he's got to stand trial for those things. What I want to know is how that can be, and the sitting president of the United States skates on dozens and dozens and dozens of boxes of classified uh, materials in a, in a multitude of locations. Can I respond? Yeah, yeah, please. That's why I brought it oh, up. Okay. First of all, as you know, the president enjoys a degree of immunity, which, in my opinion, is why Donald Trump is running for president again. I don't think he's running for president. I think he's <laughs> running for immunity from prosecution. But also, there is no evidence that Joe Biden knowingly concealed classified You're documents. You're never going to get evidence, police, Richard. Sir. Hold on, Richard, Richard, Richard. I've got to go here because the, the show is over. But you're never going to get that evidence because they won't investigate. That's my point. 
They won't investigate him. They won't even interview him. They won't even say, Mr. President, anything to say about this. They completely act like it never happened, and that's that's the two-tiered system of justice. Hey, thanks to the team. Thanks to you for listening. God bless you. Be well. Be safe. Have a great weekend. See you next time. Dennis Prager here. Thanks for listening to the Daily Dennis Prager Podcast. To hear the entire three hours of my radio show, commercial-free, every single day, become a member of PragerTopia. You'll also get access to 15 years' worth of archives, as well as the daily show prep. Subscribe at PragerTopia.com.